every film that I make, even for my student films, I always was trying to push, always push myself into the unknown. Do something you haven't done before and challenge yourself in a new way and then find a way to make something cinematic. I got into filmmaking, I, I would say, because I started working on films and I was just asked to help out on a crew. And it was the collective experience of being on a set and being with a crew and having to solve problems because I didn't come from a background necessarily of loving cinema and going to the movies and my families were really into the movies and I grew up wanting to be a film director. There's nothing like that. I had kind of hope or maybe like the idea of being an architect. I was studying graphic design. I liked doing something visual and something creative. Um, but it was all very solo, that type of work. And then working on a film, short films, just student films, I just really enjoyed being out in the middle of it and having to solve a problem collectively. And then once you solve one problem, you have the next problem. And the idea of like using your brain to how to come up with a solution don't panic, stay cool, stay calm. And being a part of a team, I thought was so much more interesting and exciting than working alone doing graphic design. Then when I was working on films, people would always say, oh, you know, this shot is a little bit like this film or that film. And I remember not knowing what they were talking about. I hadn't seen any of these films. So what came next was, well, now I want to know what everyone's talking about. And now I want to lo learn the history. So going to university, I did a, a degree which had quite a lot of theoretical work within it. And so I learned more about the history of cinema and I started to watch more films. And so whilst working on films, I was learning about the history and watching films. And so that process of catching up then becomes another joy of being interested in cinema and filmmaking. Right from very early short films, um, the idea became, well, if I cast someone, I you know might cast a an Asian person or a black person, but they're not like telling a story that is Asian or about a black experience, which at the time was all that was being told. You know, if you're an Asian person in a TV show or in a film in England, when I was starting out in the industry, they had to be suffering from racism or they were being forced into a marriage and you know, all this crap that was like, these are the stories that are being told. And so I was like, no, this story is about whatever it's going to be about. And it just happened to be Asian, like me. You know, and I think that became a big deal, just making films with people who just happen to be of colour, not specifically about that. Um, and then as I made more and more films, I made a student films in India with street kids. I just liked the location as an epic place to make a film, but also I could do something magical, realist, which wasn't naturalistic because I've grown up with kind of these sorts of stories and folk tales and faith and religion and all this stuff that sort of sits above naturalism. And we had a big history in the UK of like Ken Loach or Mike Lee or, you know, this sort of naturalism is English cinema. And I always was thinking I'd like to do the opposite and do something else. And I like Westerns. 
So even though I grew up in North London, oh, I'll go and make a Western. You know, that was always the fun for me. So when I started out, I started out doing drama. And I was interested with The Warrior and with Far North and other films that I made. The image was all important. And I wanted to make big scale cinema. And then what happened was I made a few of those. And I thought, actually, one, it's really hard. But also, it just seemed a little bit time was moving on. And that, that way of filmmaking, either you make it and you get the opportunity to make another one, another one, another one, or something comes along and changes your direction of your career or your life. In our case, we had kids. And that type of filmmaking, where I went to the North Pole and I've shot films in the Himalayas and deserts and really extreme places where the crew were like, all of us were like, really, it was about survival as much as anything. Suddenly you have children and you're like, well, I don't want to be away that long. So I've got to figure out how to make movies, but also be around with the kids. Sorry to jump around, but with The Warrior, the key thing was I'm British, I'm a Londoner, I'm European, but my background is from India. So I made my student film in India, not in English. And a lot of people thought, why are you doing this? You know, this is not a calling card. Your job is to make something that is a calling card that will get you a job in the industry. Making a film in India with street kids is not going to get you a job. And I remember having lots of people giving me this advice and I was, I don't care, I wanna, that's what I want to do. That film won a prize at Cannes and got me an agent and got me like some money to write. Everyone said, you've got to come up with a sensible first film. A sensible first film would be a British film and a film. So I tried to write my version of Do The Right Thing in London, a London film, that's what you have to do. And what happened was at the time in London, everybody was doing gangster films. There were lots of hit kind of cockney gangster films. And um, I thought, if everyone's doing that, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. And so my idea became The Warrior, which was Western, shot in India, with, not in English, with hardly any dialogue, with Indian actors, which I don't think anyone had really done before. If people from the UK made a film in India, it normally had a white person as the lead going to India. You know, it's about their experience in India. And um, I, I said, I'm not going to cast anyone from the UK. I'm not going to make it in English, which just was not the done thing then. This is over 20 years ago. And somehow we got the money together and we did it on the basis of the script. And we made like what everyone thought was quite an epic first film. So from people saying this is a terrible idea to it, it ended up winning the kind of British Academy Award for Best British Film. And it was a British film not made in English, which was really radical and different. इस वर्ष बरसात नहीं हुई पूरे गांव की फसलें बर्बाद हो गई बस हमारे पास इतना ही कहां गए ये तरंग गांव का पहले भी ऐसा हुआ हां मैं आपका वफादार हूं मुझे माफ करो I've always thought this, each film is like a period of your life. Like the person when I made my student films, I'm not the same person now. The person who made The Warrior could on his own go off and travel around India for six months. 
looking for the locations, looking for cast with his best friend, and we just would hire a car and do everything on our own. And then you get older and you like you don't work like that anymore. You get people, other people do things for you and you hire a team. Um, so I think it changes. There's not a set, I haven't, I don't think I have a set rule. I think there are themes of like characters and outsiders taking on a system or a corrupt system that always excite me. All of the films I would say, one of my tutors at film school said she noticed this in all of my short films. And I never thought about it before, but then when I follow all of the films, they're always about an individual taking on a system, a kind of corrupt system. And most of the time they don't win. Whatever we want to look into that, that's something that interests me. Um, And so what I found and what I have generally ended up doing is that I like, I'm quite independent in terms of the types of projects that I do. And I don't really, I don't really want to be, contracted to anyone I like having being my own boss I work with lots of people but I'm pretty much like to be my own boss to figure out what I want to do and how I want to do it in my own time and I find the films that have been most successful have been the ones where I've had more freedom to just find my own way Um, one of the reasons I switched from fiction to documentaries I started to feel I slightly fell out of love with drama and the process of writing a script raising the money casting waiting 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 for casting waiting rewrite the script waiting shoot something notes rewrite re-edit reshoot whatever and you put something out and you just think somewhere along the way it just got worse and worse and worse whether it's the development stage of screen screenplay writing whether it's somehow the edit or the shoot i just remember the more involved people were the less happy i was with the work and the films that have done well for me have always ones where I've sort of like, once I can get past the stage of putting it together, the more you leave me alone, the better the film will be. The more money you might make and the more awards you might win, but it's generally I'm happier and everyone else is happier. And so that becomes the most important thing for me is how can I make work where I'm pretty much in control of the process? And if that means I have to make films for less money and make them documentaries, but I'm left alone more, they're better films, I'm happier, and they become more successful. And the machine of fiction became less and less interesting and exciting to me. Singing has always been important to me, but I never thought I'll I'll end up singing, I'll be a singer. I just thought I'm lucky that it's something I can always do if I want to, I'm so lucky like that. I felt like I had nothing new that was coming out at the time that really represented me or the way I felt. So I, you know, I just started writing. I wouldn't write anything unless it was directly personal to me, just because I wouldn't be able to tell the story right. I'm not a girl trying to be a star or trying to be anything other than a musician. How big do you think you're going to be? I don't. I don't think I'm going to be at all famous. I don't think I could handle it. I would probably go mad, you know what I mean? I would go mad. Is it hard to know who you can trust? Yeah. When I'm making a documentary, I will often start off by seeing what I, you know, steal, see what we can steal off the internet, start editing it, talk to someone, interview them, put that interview in the edit, go and interview someone else, edit some more, do some more research, and everything happens at the same time. I I literally try to do it all at the same time. And that is organically out of a concept or a feeling or an idea the film comes. Now, sometimes you may have a character, and you may have a character like Amy Winehouse, so people know of her or have an opinion of her, and there'll be, I don't like her, or I think she's an idiot, or she's an alcoholic, or she's a junkie, or I think her songs are great. They have some sort of idea, and they know the ending, which is interesting with Senna and with Amy, the opposite of fiction films. Like, people go to see a drama, you don't want to know the ending before you start, generally. When with these, both of these documentaries, people knew the ending. So the film isn't about the ending, it's about the journey, and about the way they live. And so each of those was about me saying, well, what you think you know about her, I don't think you're right. I think there's a whole other story that you don't know, and I'm going to tell you that story. Reveal the truth. And the way Amy was interesting, because it was the first feature film that I've made, 
I think first of all, any form I made where there was no piece of paper. There was no script. There was no pitch. There was no treatment. There was not one... Pa- we didn't write a paragraph and have to get it cleared by someone. It was... Somebody had seen a previous film, Senna, and had liked it, contacted my producer at the time. My producer contacted me. I had to think about it, spoke to my wife. She's like, you should do it. She's great. Okay, that's interesting. Did a bit of research, a little listening. And there was just this gut feeling that I've made lots of global, I've made lots of international films. I hadn't made a film at home in London. And I thought, okay, this is going to be my London film. This is going to be a film about where I am from, North London. Everything I love which is like you can be a young Jewish girl into jazz and hip hop and you can be really creative and mouthy and look different and create your own. And everything I hate, which is like the media and the paparazzi and all the bullshit that comes with fame and press and how people are mistreated. And so I thought, okay, we can do this. And I had a meeting with someone, we spoke to them and they said, okay. I said, these are the rules. Funny that you mentioned earlier. We have to have all of the music. We have to have all of the publishing. I should be allowed to speak to anyone I want to speak to. You can't tell me who I can and cannot interview. Give us two years. They were going to pay for it. Give us two years. Leave me alone. Once in two years, we'll come back with a film. That's our agreement. And they were like, okay. And then we went off for two years and made a film with no piece of paper and no pitch and no, this is how it's going to start. This is episode two or whatever. It was just like, we'll make a film. And that film was like an amazing experience because it became an investigation I felt into a crime. A young person died at 27 in like broad daylight in London. And I was like, how can that happen in this day and age? Why, who was looking after her? And that question is the whole movie. That's what it becomes about. And so sometimes all you need is an instinctive question in the back of your mind. And that for me is enough. Because I had these feelings, I had these words floating around in me. You write a song, you have to remember how you felt. You have to remember what the weather was like. You have to remember what his neck smelled like. You have to remember all of it. She would tell me stories about Blake and this tempestuous, extreme relationship. That first day she wrote back to Black all the lyrics and the melody in two or three hours. Same old safe bed. Me and my head high and my tears dry. Get on without my guy. You went back to what you know. So The most recent film that I've got coming out, Creature, is the same thing. There was no piece of paper, there was no script, there was a a, a work of art that existed, but it was never going to come out potentially. It was never going to be performed, this dance that Akram Khan had created. So very different process of coming in, talking on a Zoom call to Akram, realise we we get along, I think we could collaborate. And then it was a question of watching a rehearsal, seeing kind of being blown away by whatever universe he had created. I, I only saw the first section of it. I didn't even see all of it. And I just thought, I just got a feeling this could be a movie. 
And then it became about how can I make this something different and turn it into a film but that isn't a classical recording of a live performance, but somehow be within it and make it another another work of art based on a work of art, which is based on a work of literature. So I thought that was an interesting kind of development. And I think the collaboration, as I get older, the collaboration is what's really exciting. Just work with brilliant people, whatever you can do. If you can just be around brilliant people, then you'll be all right. And I think that's what happened with that film. Each film will have a different set of boundaries or restrictions. And with Creature, it was always known that there's this tiny window where the dancers have rehearsed and, and, and have perfected the show, which they're ready to go and perform. But if they don't perform it, in two weeks, they move on to the next show. They start rehearsing all over again something else and they will never have performed it. So it was a given. I can come in for the end of the rehearsal, watch some of it. We were told we had 10 days. Within that 10 days, we were free to do whatever we want. I could have made a short film. And that was really exciting to just make something really quickly and just put it out there. And all of the conversations that I've had with the creator, Akram, and the dancers, you know, the lead character, Jeffrey, all of them happened after we completed the film, which I've never had the experience of making a work, of making a movie with somebody, but we never, ever sat down to have breakfast and lunch together, as you would normally, because we were in lockdown. So we were never meeting. We just saw the show, shot it, performed it and went away. And years later, we're still talking about what it's all about. with um, dance, I really was an outsider. And, and that's what's always exciting. I come in, I watch something, that first impression for me is really important. That's when I know this could be a project that I want to direct, whatever I feel like that gut instinct. And I've learned from quite young, I suppose, to trust my gut. That's like the main tool that I think I have to figure out what to do and what not to do. And the f first gut feeling on seeing the dance was... I think this is really powerful and scary and I don't really know what it is, but I like the fact that I don't know what it is, but it, I think it's really cinematic and that was enough. You know, that was enough. Knowing anything about dance, someone else would have done it a different way. It makes it a lot easier to break rules and to do something if you can claim ignorance. I'm quite good at that. I think that's one of my strong points, actually, is to go into a room and an interview with no matter how important or how big the person is and say, I don't know anything about you. Why don't you tell me? And they're used to everyone having read all of their books. It happened to me last week. I did an interview with some, a very brilliant person and they kept referring to their book. And I kept saying, well, the book's not going to help me make a film. I've got to talk to you and I have to talk to you like I don't know what you're talking about for you to give me the information to put into a film. And I think that is part of the problem is that often you think you're watching films with people, everyone knows this is important or everyone and you and my job is to be the audience. And the first job is the audience should know nothing. And then they learn along the way. And I that's how I come in. I come in and not knowing anything. But that is like you get quite obsessed. I'm quite obsessive in a way about my characters and my story and 
and I'll take anyone on. You know, that's what it's got to be now. So you've got to pick the right character that you're ready to fight for. You know, with Amy, I remember if I typed Amy into Google before we started a movie, just while we we're doing a research, there'd just be thousands of images of her looking awful, like the worst images you've seen. And you're just like, and I remember thinking at the time, I didn't really understand how the internet worked. I'm like, why? Just imagine someone has decided that that's how you sum up a human being. Like if you look for somebody, that's what you're given as the answer. How did that happen? Who decided that? So a lot of it becomes like a question that I'm trying to figure out. Like who, who's decided those are the images that I need to see first? This is long before all of the Cambridge Analytica and all this idea of how Google and technology is being used and how algorithms drive us to a certain thing. The worst of a human being is what you're given. So I remember feeling, well, one of my missions will be is if I get this film right, when you then look up Amy, at the end of the film, hopefully everyone's perception will have changed. You see her looking beautiful and amazing and great because she was. But we're going to have to change that. I remember talking to producers and, and other people and, and all of the awful things that people would say when the film was first being mentioned in the media. Just like loads of men just saying the worst things about Amy. I kept thinking, well, what do you know about her? Why can you feel so confident saying this about a young person who died? A producer wanted me to do a film for them. And I, I said, look, I'm thinking I might, before I do this project, I might do this film about Amy Winehouse. And I remember him saying, you know, what the fuck do you want to make a film about a junkie for? I was like, because of people like you. That's why, you know, because of people like you, the fact that you feel so confident to say that. So that is also, I suppose, for me, a bit of a mission of finding the characters that I'm willing to fight for. Maybe never met them, but I'm like, it's got to be someone that for three years I'm going to live with. They become a part of my life. They take over every dinner, part, dinner party conversation I have. Someone says, "What well, are you making a film about? And my wife will go, oh, no, don't answer. Because the minute, you know, the minute I answer, I'm, like, I'm gone. I'm like, I'm going to bloody bore everyone. But that is like, you get quite obsessed. I'm quite obsessive in a way about my characters and my story. And so I think for me, the, the bit underneath for me is always like, you've got to have a, something that you want to change the perception, like the way the general public feel about someone. I'm going to take you on. In 1978, I came to Europe for the first time to compete outside Brazil in the World Championship. It was pure driving, pure racing. There wasn't any politics, no money involved either. So it was real racing. And each character, Senna had an antagonist, which was Alain Prost, his great rival. And in that film, in Senna, it was about simplifying the number of drivers down to two. Senna and Prost. Simplifying all of the tech and all of the cars. Less is more. Simplify it, simplify it. Two cars. Red car, good. Blue car, bad. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know about technology. You don't need to know about the tyres, engines. People who are Formula 1 fans are all obsessed with that. It's like, don't need to know. No one cares. Simple. Two people. One who wins by driving as slow as he can. Prost. One who drives and wants to win by going as fast as he can. He believes in God, he doesn't. And, you know, simplify it so that anyone can get it. Ayrton has a small problem. He thinks that he can't kill himself. And I think that's very dangerous. You are competing to win. And if you no longer go for a gap, you're no longer a racing driver. What are you willing to not compromise on? What is it about? What's the idea? What's the bit that I am bringing to it that's different? With Senna, it was no talking heads. He's narrating his life story. If you don't know the story, you, you think this is kind of an amazing journey he's going on. When I showed it in America at Sundance and festivals like that, people didn't know anything about him. So they fell in love with him, but they had no idea he was going to die. And it was so shocking for them to think this character dies during the film, they had no idea. And it was like, I don't want you to know. I want you to forget that. I want you to think he's alive. 
when you're watching it. So you enjoy the life and then you have the sadness. And all the films begin with the ending and then they flash back and they have an interview and the people are being interviewed are much older and everyone watching it will go, why haven't you interviewed Ayrton Senna? Did he not approve? Is he not, oh, maybe he's dead, you know. People think a different way if they worry about the interviews. And I don't want them to worry about the interviews. I had a lot of pressure from the financiers and the producers to do interviews because that's how a documentary is made. And I kept, my instinct kept saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And I shot interviews and they would try to cut them in. So I, Hitchcock always said, never shoot coverage if you don't intend to use it. So I would do interviews, but I'd put the microphone here. <laughs> and so... When they try to cut it in, there's a microphone here. And they were like, why have you put the microphone there? And I said, because I wanted to get good sound. And, <laughs> and I was very close to being fired. And I was like, I don't care. I'm not going to do it because I think you're going to ruin the film. That was a big fight. It doesn't just happen easily where you do something different. So yeah, that, that idea of when are you ready to say this is the thing that you're going to fight for? And you stick with it because that is, I think, really important. It's very important to me and that's important to a lot of filmmakers. I can't remember your question, but that's the answer. <laughs>